It's road trip time. Dr. Rhonda Patrick here. Today I'm in San Jose at the Fitness Expo where the National Pro Grid League games are taking place. And I'm sitting here with my friend, Jim Keen, who happens to be CEO of the National Pro Grid League or the MPGL. I'm really excited to have a conversation with Jim because he's all around a really interesting dude. He's a- Thank you, Rhonda. You're, you're a serial entrepreneur, Jim. You founded a company called Wellness FX. And for those of you listening, Wellness FX is a company that allows consumers to directly order blood tests without needing a doctor's prescription and to track that data over time. You also founded a company called Sapien Health Network, which went on to become WebMD's consumer health business. Yes, that's correct. In addition to that, you've got a pretty dynamic athletic history. You played college football, track, you did ballet dancing, mm -hmm. you partaken in the CrossFit games, you hiked the, Nash, the uh, Pacific Crest Pacific Trail, Crest. which is- All 2,700 miles. Crazy, yeah. so yeah. really, really interesting. Um, background and lots of perspective, but I think where you and I have the most overlap is that we're both self-experimenters. Yes. And so maybe we could start there by talking a little bit about the quantified self movement, what you think about the movement and what where you think it's going. Um, sure. Well, you, you know, it's interesting to me as we look at, the, at where we are in history and you think even 15 years ago, the tools that we had back then we're fairly primitive, right? We're still kind of back in the days of the LDL tells you all about heart health that you'd ever want to know. And here we are 15 years later, and, and a lot of people actually, and then, then 10 years later after that, so 2010 when I founded uh, Wellness Effects, not a lot of people knew about fractionated proteins, or if you did, it was kind of the highly expensive, kind of just unattainable for the average person, uh, lipoprotein fractions, right? And then if you were like the CEO of Exxon, you got that. And so then I really feel like my company had a big role in starting to democratize this, but also let people know that your biology didn't have to be your destiny and that you could actually get these tests that you used to think were the, like the magic behind the curtain secrets that you know wealthy people, movie stars had. So now that those are out, when we look at where we are in the stage of development, you're starting to see the prices come down. You're starting to see accessibility. And given the internet, you can pool all this knowledge. So it's really exciting right now, just where it's going from like early adopters. I think we're right in that kind of inflection curve. Yeah, I, I think what's really um, interesting about Wellness FX is that you, know, you were able to, there's a lot of companies right now that are not able to overcome the, the um, hurdle of having bypassing a doctor's you know prescription to get your cholesterol checked to get you know different micronutrients or different you know hormones tested in your blood and you were able to to overcome that which is really interesting how were you able to do that well so you're right it's it's prescribed and prescriptions are all regulated at the state level and, and each state board of medicine has a heavy influence on state law about how that happens so we literally started in California and then California and New York are by far the most difficult too. I don't think they're in New York still, but we took California. And if you get California, you generally, when you review the statutes of each state, can get about another 20 if you just make some tweaks. And so that's how we got going. And when I sold the company at the end of 2013, we had 47 out of 51 jurisdictions. And we were looking at Canada as well, which ironically was probably more, it was probably easier to go to Canada than it would be to go to Maryland which really? was one of the un remaining ones we haven't gone into yet. Yeah, so one of the things um, also that I really like about Wellness FX is that, you know, it, it allows you to 
measure, you know, your cholesterol, your different LDL, you know, particles and your, you know, different vitamin D levels, thyroid levels, a, a whole host of, you know, different biomarkers that are relevant for um, nutrient, for, you know, performance, for, you know, just health in general. And it allows you, you know, to track that data over time so you can actually see, you know, what dietary and lifestyle changes you've made, you know, and how those have affected. You can quantify those, right. those markers. And, and that's like the beauty of this quantified self movement is because now you have something you can measure and say, look, this, I'm taking, you know, vitamin D now or I'm doing X, Y, or Z now and this, you know, my, my C-reactive protein's gone down or, you know, something like that where, Whereas it's, instead of it just being guesswork where you think you feel better or something like that. Or, or you know, the traditional get the physical twice, you know, once every two years and you get the blood test with it. Well, it really doesn't. That's a snapshot in time. And the other thing I think came out of this whole deal is, is that kind of quantified self, in another way of saying that is it's always quantify yourself mm -hmm. regularly because you want to figure out the trend. You want right. the picture, you don't want the individual data point. Absolutely. The individual data point maybe is useful for saying, hey, you have a, a full-blown fire going on in your attic. Right. But it could also say that you just happen to get done with the flu and you're highly inflamed. Exactly. So, or that you're stressed. Right. You know, when you're stressed or when you're inflamed, you actually make more VLDL. Yeah. So your your your, it's kind of your, your body's high. adaptive response at it that is. point. So. It's, it's interesting because um, when... In, during an inflamed state, your body makes more VDL, VLDL because it binds up what's called endotoxin, which is... Yeah, and it's a beneficial uh, thing for you right, uh, at that point. It's kind of like a sponge soaking up this bad stuff that can right. do all this damage. So your body is like, wait a minute, i got to make more of this you know, cholesterol so I can sop up this stuff that could damage other parts of you know, right. my body. So, and so if you get just one time, you go to the doctor and they measure your cholesterol and it's really high, your doctor's going to get you on statins. And, so, and yeah. they do. They, they yeah. do Versus an end of if, one. If you, say, if you know that you know, my bi biology is super plastic and every 100 days I have a new crop of blood cells that have responded to you the past 100 days, you, or, or fresh, uh, it's a fresh slate. And so I'm going to do this every you know, three or four months. And even after a year, I'll have a really good idea what I should be working on. Right. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really good, the quantified self movement in general is a really good thing because people are becoming more educated. People are tracking and, and measuring, you know, their own biology so that they can, um, you know, make, make, make progress, whether that's progress in becoming more, you know, mentally uh, bettering their mental performance or bettering their physical performance or just extending the fit part of their life, which I know that's something that we're all yeah. interested in, being as fit as long as we can. Um, you know, extending your lifespan is one thing, but extending your fit span or your health span is, is also really, really important. Well, you know, so you get all these complex movements, but by the time I was getting towards the tail end of when I was running Wellness FX, I was starting to transition to this different idea, and things got out a lot simpler for me because I kind of knew the things I had to work on, and I could ignore 98% of the other biomarkers. So it's kind of funny. I had this big wide funnel, and they say, all right, here's the things that I know that for me really moves the needle for me um, because once I say, discovered that my vitamin D being at 50 is my optimal level, Higher than that, my inflammation would go up. Lower than that, my inflammation would go up. So once I kind of had that and I knew how to titrate myself, then I pretty much started ignoring it, you know? That's very interesting. So what else? The vitamin D um, in itself, there is a U-shaped curve mm -hmm. with vitamin D levels and right. mortality. And, you know, too much vitamin D can be bad because several reasons. It causes the same things on both ends. It does. Yeah. And it's very interesting. So, what, what other biomarkers for you were you? Because you're a pretty fit guy. I mean, you're in your 50s. Yeah. So right? I, I also got over my fear of cholesterol, you know, or my societal generated fear of cholesterol. And I know I'll have some doctor friends who will call me after this and criticize me or saying this and we'll, we'll agree to disagree. But for me, it really got down to I was measuring my ratio of uh, APOA and uh, APOB, mm -hmm. right? And then if that was a good ratio, then, because uh, those are my the best fraction of the HDL and the best and the worst fraction of the LDL right. for me. Then, if I measure that ratio, but then said, okay, if that's in a pretty good ratio, and my inflammation is always in pretty good order, like homocysteine and CRP, then I'm doing pretty well, and I'm not going to even pay attention. So I don't even care about LDL anymore. Uh, as long as my ratio is good and my inflammation is good, I'm pretty good. Exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, that's... I work out a lot, so uh, I always have kind of high levels of ApoB, but my um, ApoA is just completely off the charts. So it's highly protective, and, and my ratio is great. And as long as my inflammation's down, I, I could care less. Right. How often do you work out? Like, what's a typical day workout for? Well, it came down to kind of the other things. So one book I, I really, I, I've gotten more and more into just the influence that your inputs have on your biology, because we're this complex system of, you know, 100 trillion cells, and 10 of them are actually work for Jim Keen Inc. The other 90 are sub, you know, independent contractors who yeah. happen to reside with my other cells. And so I, I started thinking about myself as a system and how do I manage that and what inputs uh, influence both my cells and my biome and, and basically diet. So lifestyle, and I also think it's all cumulative. So things like my house is always super clean. Take off my shoes because if you walk on on pavement, you accumulate heavy metals, and so decreasing kind of the biological load of toxins and heavy metals, uh, you know, cleaning products, things I wash myself with, just all those. If you show, you know, one day is not going to matter, but if you do it every single day, then it's cumulative. So decreasing the amount of work I have to do to to maintain kind of a clean system is good. The other thing is. When I really get down to the two things I boil it down to are, it, it sounds really simple, but it's maintain your sensitivity to insulin, mm -hmm. right? Because when that decreases, it decreases with age, then you kind of have onset diabetes and other things like that. So number one. Number two, which goes hand in hand with number one, is your lean muscle mass. So maintaining lean muscle mass is just so beneficial for you. I mean, you have your movement, your mobility, your circulation, your ability to um, just do things. It soaks up a lot of excess uh, carbohydrates and other things like that. So those two things for me are the most important. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because lean muscle mass uh, recently has been shown to soak up what's called um, kynurenine, which is something that's generated from inflammation. It's, it's, I didn't know that. So it's made so. from tryptophan. So we mm -hmm. eat, tri we eat tri tryptophan when we eat protein. And tryptophan can either be metabolized into serotonin, so tryptophan gets into the brain and gets converted to serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. Or if you're inflamed or sick or stressed, all those things shunt tryptophan into producing something called kynurenine. Yeah. Kynurenine then gets converted into something called quinolinic acid, which crosses over the blood-brain barrier and causes neuroinflammation. Uh, muscle, when you exercise, muscle um, creates, uh, turns kynurenine into a metabolic byproduct that cannot be right. converted into quinolytic acid. So literally, and by, by the way, this quinolytic acid, which goes into the brain and creates neuroinflammation, is um, also associated with depression, many other different you know, brain Well, it's disorders. interesting you say that. So when the, a lot of times when I've had people say, oh, I'm so depressed, and I'll say, oh, I, uh, first thing I think is uh, since serotonin, a lot of it's produced in the gut, I always ask them, what's your diet like? Yeah. Oh, so the serotonin gut thing. Let me let me say this. Um, most of the serotonin is produced in your gut, like ninety percent of yeah. it. But what's interesting is that the serotonin produced in your gut doesn't cross over the blood-brain oh, barrier. Oh, it doesn't. So no. does it does it uh, affect your mood or not? So the serotonin in the gut actually um, causes. It, so it, your your gut cells make it, and your um, platelets take it up, and it plays mm -hmm. a role in like vasoconstriction and, and clotting. Uh, okay. And it also um, causes inflammation in the gut. So, is the, in your brain, is it manufactured in your brain then? But it's manufactured. So, the uh -huh. tryptophan either gets converted to serotonin in your gut, in which case it doesn't uh -huh. get into the brain, or when you exercise, branch chain amino acids like leucine and isoleucine yeah. get taken up into your muscle. And they alleviate the competition between tryptophan and branch chain amino acids, right. which usually occurs in the brain. So, so tryptophan gets into your brain more when you're exercising because you're not having that competition with other branch chain amino acids. So, so exercise itself makes less serotonin so in the do, gut and so more I had the of wrong it in the brain. Intu intuition uh, for the right reason. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The mechanism you had a little off, but you're right. It, it does make yeah, more yeah. serotonin in the in the brain. But yeah. So those two things. So uh, I, I think if you can maintain your lean muscle mass through your life, which implies a whole chain of activities that had you doing that and you maintain your insulin sensitivity. Um, and then the thing that really key for me is, have you ever read Grain Brain? No, but I'm aware of, I'm aware of it. Yeah. So David per Perlmuter uh, wrote that book, and he has a new book out that I've heard really good things about, but it's On one of the, the gut, most, right? yeah, yeah, and it's one of the most extensively researched books from a scientific standpoint. And literally he has these massive studies that he has found um, that are, 
he's a very statistically driven and quantitatively driven, so very high quality uh, ones that he does these meta studies. Yeah. And he consistently shows that if you are soaking yourself in simple sugars yeah. or simple carbohydrates, uh, in essence, you're stupider. <laughs> So he, and it was quite controversial, but he doesn't get into like belief systems. He mm -hmm. just says, here it is. Yeah. And so it, it's actually, um, from a mechanistic standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. You know, when you're, if you become insulin resistant, first of all, this one, you'll find this interesting. Uh, recently, they found there's a biomarker, a blood biomarker that you can measure. Um, and this blood mark, my biomarker is called IRS1. It's insulin receptor substrate like one. Uh -huh. And if it's inactive, it's a, it, it, you can um, measure it in the blood. If it's inactive, this inactive form of it, right. it's a 10-year predictor of Alzheimer's disease, hmm. so, which gives you a 10-year you know, time you know, to window yeah, to yeah. make a dietary lifestyle change. But I, it's very interesting that, that that is a biomarker that can, with 100% accuracy, can mm -hmm. predict Alzheimer's disease. But anyways, um, you know, insulin resistance is associated with, you know, inflammation and, and these things. Inflammatory molecules cross over the blood-brain barrier and they start to activate uh, microglial cells, which then cause amyloid right. beta plaques to aggregate. Amyloid beta, beta plaques play a major role in Alzheimer's and this causes this vicious cycle, but, you know, absolutely... You know, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetics are more, more uh, likely to get Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, and so he's actually, in the book, he calls, uh, he names kind of CNS diseases as uh, type 3 diabetes. Right. So, so it's really interesting to have that perspective. It's also a very important, we were talking about cholesterol earlier, the, the insulin resistance and the inflammation that, you know, results from, from being insulin resistant having you know, blood sugar around and not having your cells, I mean, there's a whole thing in your cells not being able to make energy and all this stuff, but what's also interesting is that that is the major problem with cholesterol, not the cholesterol itself. LDL for, yeah. is what I'm talking. When I say cholesterol, most people know HDL is good and LDL is bad. That's pretty much, I think, the general public right. knows that. But you, know, you actually need LDL. You need LDL cholesterol to repair damage of any cell that's Yeah, done. I mean, how do you build muscle otherwise? How do you build new yeah. cells? You need, you need cholesterol. That's what LDL does. It shuttles it to the cell. Mm -hmm. Whatever organ, whatever tissue needs repair, you know, we're constantly damaging our tissues, just living, normal, normal yeah. living. Working out, you're definitely, you know, causing more damage. But, um, so you need LDL, but the problem is when you have inflammation, the inflammatory... Um, things that are released, endotoxins. So when you're, you know, endotoxins released from the gut, I mean, this is a major thing that happens with people who are eating a lot of sugar. Sugar, like, literally causes what's called the mucin, which is right. what makes the gut barrier to, like, break down. And so you start to generate endotoxin. And because endotoxin binds to cholesterol, the same receptor on the cholesterol that is used to recycle it back to the liver is what binds endotoxin. So what happens is that your LDL gets to your cell and it gets cleaved because it gives a little piece of the LDL to the, to the tissue or cell to repair yeah. it. Now what's left is a smaller particle, so the smaller LDL particle then bound, gets bind up to this endotoxin and now it can't get recycled. So now you have endotoxin sitting around bound to LDL in your circulation. This is a signal for your immune cells. They're like, oh, bacteria. So now you have macrophages and stuff going, I got to get rid of this. Uh -huh. So they come and try to get rid of it, but they can't get rid of it because it's cholesterol. Right. And so you get the beginning of this, you know, foam cell forming in yeah. your, in your yeah. blood vessels. And that, so the danger really is the inflammation. So, I mean, I think that, you know, 20 years ago, the blunt way of dealing with this was, okay, just cut out the cholesterol. Right. I mean, and, and you know, it, it makes sense to some people who won't change their life. They won't, you know... Getting them on statins will probably increase your lifespan by five years. There's yeah. a whole host of problems that come along with it, but for those people that won't do anything, it probably will extend their life for a few years. Well, it's been interesting doing this fitness league is there's kind of one dirty secret I found out doing it is I, uh, um, if you're in a fitness, if you're CEO of a fitness league, you get less fit. <laughs> because... because I travel so much, it's like being with the circus. Uh, you're loading up 200,000 pounds of weight, and so I'm going around getting less fit, and so you're asking me, uh, I mean, I was having some people ask me what I do now, and so I generally work out in my garage when I'm at home, and then when I'm on the road, I have the kindliness of various CrossFit box owners who uh, welcome me into their 
into their gyms. And so I've been mostly just lifting weights and doing randomized workouts and trying to kind of maintain myself while I run this league. Wow. Do you do like traditional CrossFit training? Mm -hmm. You do? It's the first, uh, it's the first year I haven't been in the uh, top 200 of my category. So uh, I like was 255th and, but literally I haven't been working out that much. So, yeah. So the, the, the NPGL, the National Pro mm-hmm. League, um, which is the event that I've witnessed here for the first time, was really right. um, blew my mind. Actually, I've never I've never been to a CrossFit game. I've never seen a CrossFit games. In fact, I've never really even wit- watched someone do like traditional CrossFit, CrossFit training. So this was all very new to me. Yeah, and, and these are all movements that derive from uh, standard Olympic disciplines like Olympic lifting. You'll see it next year in the Summer Olympics, gymnastics mm-hmm. and track and field. And so it's kind of the greatest hits of those. And, and a lot of it's been really interesting designing a sport because if you do it from scratch, you can use a lot of technologies that say the old traditional sports haven't had. And I've really read into like the subconscious cues that cause people to decide to follow a sport or be a sport fan. It's been quite fascinating from a behavioral standpoint because I used a lot of game mechanics uh, when my, my team and I were designing this last year because in the past, Fitness events like the CrossFit Games were in for three to five days, and they're a big cattle call of people. They're hard to follow, and they don't fit the traditional form factor of a spectator sport that you can view in like a two or three hour segment on TV. And so you can design it to do that. So we simplified a lot of things. We created rules. We also borrowed freely from existing sports and kind of took these kind of cognitive foundations that people assign, like the box score that you see in baseball. We, our box score kind of looks like baseball. Okay. And, you know, there's something like seven factors that separate uh, a functional fitness, or not functional fitness, but a pro sport, a spectator sport, from any form of entertainment. And so, and I use this framework of this book that was written in 81, the first chapter of it outlines it perfectly. And so, ever since, my whole staff refers back to it. And a couple of the factors are like, uh, Spectator sports generate patriotism. So that's why you'll see the San Francisco fire. So, and they have their colors and their identity and, and it's their flag almost. Right. So, so that's a very primal trait to be right. territorial and patriotic. Of course. So yeah. that's fans. Um, American fans demand justice. So we have instant replay and each coach can throw a flag once per match if he sees like maybe a round or a repetition wasn't counted correctly or an error in the rules. So you can have justice because uh, you don't want to lose by a bad call. Uh, you also have uh, the vicariousness. So American fans, a lot of people have fairly ordinary eight to five day lives and so sports for a lot of people becomes this artificial world where they understand all the rules because most individuals like ISIS appears in the Middle East. How much control do any of us have on that? Not a lot and so it the world becomes this incomprehensible place that you have no influence that you don't understand why things happen. However sports is this like artificial rules and if you just study the rules enough you can become an expert even if you live in your mom's basement. of the sport and everybody else in the sport will worship your level of knowledge. So all the fantasy stuff and all that. So vicariousness is the ability to master and know the sport as a fan and then freely criticize like decisions by players, management and coaches. So that, that's something people have to have. Uh, American fans hate ties. So all these things you can roll in and then what it really gets down to is the name of this book was Sports Illusion, Sports Reality. And his central premise is that every single sport in the world has conquered the requirement set up that you have to create an illusion and the illusion is is that the outcome matters because if people don't think if somebody hitting a home run in the ninth inning is important then it means that you failed at your ability to create an illusion about that sport that is that it matters but if somebody's depressed for at the end of the season because your team in the ninth inning of the seventh game of the world series um, gave up a home run and lost and for six months afterwards until the new season starts or maybe the rest of their lives, they're depressed. And I think we've all had friends through life that are profoundly depressed when their team loses. Yes. That means they've succeeded in creating the illusion. 
so that that's been a very interesting part for me and and it's a tiny bit of a dis divergence because I've always been in health and wellness and fitness but not much because this is a sport about fitness and then the great thing about doing this is we condensed it to a two-hour format last season our final ran on NBC and it generated a rating that was better than the NHL playoffs and they put us head to head against the NFL and, and I really love our sport because the rules are slightly designed or are basically designed that the seven men and seven women on the team they all their skills have to be utilized to to win and and so we didn't want to have tokenism or whatnot so it's, it's really finely balanced and you have this respect between the sexes they're cooperating so we've kind of gotten rid of segregation in sports I really was impressed with the women that I saw out there today. I mean, I've heard you say on a, a previous interview with Bloomberg Business that yeah. it really comes down to the women because the men cancel each other out in a way. So it's like the women kind of are seem to be really important in terms of. Well, they're the bigger unknown. Um, so the men, uh, and, and I've had a couple people also say, hey, are you implying that the men aren't important? I say, no, no, the men though, men have had a history as athletes of competing, being scouted, being drafted. Um, being in highly competitive programs and whatnot, so there, we, as males, if you get into like collegiate sports or even pros, you, you're used to all that. Whereas you can be the most kick-ass female athlete on the planet in a Division One program, and the day you graduate from college, you're done. You know, you can do rec leagues and stuff like that, but you may be pro level as a female, and so you've never had this pool of female talent coming out that has the same resources of being scouted and women are slightly different athletes and whatnot in how they approach things so you have these coaching staffs knowing how half the universe works having a, a lot of uh, have a pretty good idea but not a complete picture about how the other half works and so the teams last year that ended up in the finals one of them was San Francisco uh, which you saw out there today the other one was DC that played yesterday they're in the finals. They did the very best job of, of finding female talent that matched the needs of the sport and then drafting it, um, putting it together, and then training it up. And they both got to the finals. So how, how do these, tr these athletes, I mean, I watched them, and it was just amazing what they were doing. The training, mm -hmm. you know, how are they training? And, and I know I'd, I'd heard you mention previously about measuring biomarkers to see to make sure they're not overtraining because I imagine a lot of these athletes probably are dr so driven that they end up probably overtraining. It's d definitely overtraining um, was a category that we would measure for one of our channels at Wellness FX because we did a lot of CrossFit Games athletes, we did some 2012 Olympic athletes, so figuring out because every athlete always drives themselves really hard because you want to get to where you're trained to 99th percentile but if you go to 101st, all of a sudden, you're because you, it's it's not like you're a little overtrained. A lot of times, it's when you you're overtrained, you're way overtrained, right. and so that one or two percent can be profound. So, I think in the future, what I'd like to do because we're, we're going to keep as we evolve as a sport, we'll have more and more things that we bring in to help the athletes be just freaks of nature, as it were, from an athletic standpoint, uh, eat, able to leap tall buildings and lift lots of weights and do all kinds of amazing things, both gymnastically and sprinting and all that. So part of that's going to be, I'm really fascinated about uh, potentially introducing a, a wellness FX like panel for all our athletes. It's kind of both a health benefit, but as well as a research tool, because I, I like to see these athletes with that. The other thing where we're going is um, we're, the metaphor I use for designing the sport is like a gigantic video game. And everything, every surface can collect data and be fed into an architecture. And so we'll probably start putting uh, our radio frequency uh, IDs on all the athletes so we can measure on off time on the court. Yeah. But also, um, the sport is so complex and, uh, and mathematical that the floor coach has to keep an idea of about kind of max physical load. And if an athlete kind of crests that and they start hitting red line, the coach has to know, um, and in general, the average athlete, it seems like they can tolerate doing about 15% of the workload in a match, and after that, they have a rapid decline. Some athletes are phenomenal, can go up to 16 to 18%, but that, that starts to really diminish in returns. And, and yet, for a coach to internalize 14 athletes on a squad, rapid substitutions, doing the equivalent of like pitch count or rep count, 
is really hard to follow. So they're starting to have these back-end analytic groups that all they do is track athletes. And I can see athlete boards developing. Both teams will probably have analysts that look at their team and the other team to see if there's weaknesses yeah. to exploit. Um, I could also see putting on, uh, with, like Dr. Justin Mager, yeah. um, the Spectra bio harnesses uh, to measure uh, like respiration and heart rate and are they redlining right. and you know lactic and, and all that stuff. So that would become part of the game board for a athlete management during the match. What are the uh, like specific biomarkers that you have previously measured? To, to, to know that overtraining is occurring? Are there any? Oh, you know, reproductive that... hormones are, are big, like men. Uh, you know, it's funny, Dr. Major, 2012, was looking at a, a guy who's going to the CrossFit Games, and he was a top 10 athlete the year before, and his coach suspected he was overtraining. Um, but he never could quite catch him at that, and so he ran it and basically had the testosterone of like a 12-year-old girl. And so his, his hormones were crashing, he was overtraining. Wow. And so he uh, confronted the athlete, and it turned out his friends had been making fun of him because he had like, dialed back the amount of training and it was in enhancing his recovery um, as well. And they're kind of like, as 23-year-old men would do, going, oh, you're a wuss, and this and that. And so he had been secretly training on the side and adding volume. And so the coach ended up firing the athlete because they got into it. And, you know, athlete was in good enough shape. He went to the games, but he finished in, like, 30th. or He's not a top-10 athlete. And so clearly I think it, it kind of bore out the, the coach's supposition on all that. So um, are there, you know, I know that a lot of athletes, for example, they require, like, up to 20% more magnesium mm -hmm. than just normal people. And we know that even people that are non-athletes are not getting enough magnesium. So are, do, do people that are training heavily like this, like people that are in the MPGL, are they, you know, coached to get adequate levels of these micronutrients and things like this? You know, it's, it's interesting. So we're, we're not like a, an endurance sport. We're like a whole, a two hours of just max effort, you know, kind of 30 second sporadic efforts, but the athletes when they're done are just knackered. And it, I, I've been thinking, I haven't really found a supplement uh, company. So I, when I split the supplement and nutritional enhancement world um, into what's useful, I think there's two windows. There's the window an hour before the match all the way through an hour after the match. And that's like in, in race uh, prep and fueling and recovery. And since we have 11 races, four to eight minutes long, you do a race with a bunch of max effort, short burst, then you have two or three minutes of rest and you start the next race. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a, a niche in the market for somebody who can figure out a recovery drink that addresses that because I haven't seen anything that particularly is tuned to it. A lot of them are like more kind of, ooh, I'm doing a whole bunch of work over two hours and this and that versus boom, boom, boom. Right. And then the other part is when you're not doing a grid match for the athletes is more of the supplementation for, uh, you know, to basically have your recovery process and to, to me that's kind of the um, when you're doing regular training schedule and not competing so I haven't seen anybody completely matches up for that but I'll probably I may end up just partnering with a company and, and putting together our own uh, uh, approach because you know we have a lot of ad space on the MPGL and and because part of our deal with TV is uh, we run it we get part of the ad inventory allocated back to us very cool yeah so um this has really uh, been a great interview, Jim. Thank you so much for, for talking with us today. And Always a pleasure, Ron. The MPGL was awesome. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you guys came out. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jim. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.